Welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time I'm going to highlight seven things that most Linux desktop operating systems do better than Windows 10 or Windows 11. I'm making this video following a suggestion from channel member Edward Harding, who wrote, How about a video about the top cool things you can do in Linux, or what Linux can do that Windows can't? And I thought this was a fantastic video idea, so let's go and get started. The first thing that Linux does better than Windows is to offer a choice of desktop environment. Here in Windows 10, Microsoft only offers a choice of this, whilst with Windows 11, we only get a choice of this. However, with Linux, many different desktops are available, including KDE Plasma, GNOME, XFCE, Budgie, LXDE, LXQT, Mate, and Cinnamon, which is what we're running here. Linux is available in many different versions or distros, most of which have a default desktop. So, when you choose your distro, you in effect choose a desktop, although it may later be changed. And several major distros provide a choice of desktop before installation. For example, here on the Linux Mint website, we can download Linux Mint with its default Cinnamon desktop, or we can choose an XFCE desktop or a Mate desktop. Meanwhile, Fedora offers many different so-called spins, which each come with a different desktop environment or window manager. And Ubuntu, in a similar manner, is available in many different flavours, which are principally distinguished by their different desktop environments. Debian also makes available images with many different desktops, or in the main Debian installer, you can choose your desktop during the installation process. The key thing is that, unlike with Windows, in Linux, the user is never forced to use a particular desktop. Personally, I've never understood why Microsoft believes that just one desktop is sufficient for billions of users with very different use cases, let alone why Microsoft should have the power to change everybody's desktop when it launches a new version of Windows. And so, for me, a key reason for running Linux is the ability to select and retain the desktop that I'm most comfortable with. In addition to offering a choice of desktop, Linux provides a far higher level of interface customization than were permitted in Windows 10 or Windows 11. Even back in Windows XP, we had control of different interface elements. But after Windows 7, Microsoft has decided that the user should no longer be in control, with the only customization now being a global scale factor, along with controls to alter the overall font size, as well as the size of the mouse pointer. But if you want to alter the font face, let alone control individual font and other desktop elements, in Windows, you are now out of luck. However, in Linux, the situation is very different. The exact level of customization possible does depend on the distro and its desktop implementation. But here, for example, in Debian with a KDE Plasma desktop, very deep interface customization is available. If we open up settings, we can see this includes selecting the application style, what they call the Plasma style, we can set colors, we can select window decorations, and critically, from my point of view, we've got control of individual font elements, and not just the size, but also the face and the style. Similarly, in my own favorite distro and desktop combination, which are Linux Mint running the Cinnamon desktop, we also have precise control of all font and other interface elements. And indeed, here in Cinnamon, we can even set the size of scroll bars. We can do that here in Themes to make scroll bars much thicker, which I personally find much easier to use. Oh, and it's also worth noting here that some Linux distros offer a kind of hybrid of desktop choice and interface customization. For example, here in the beautiful Zorin OS, 
If we go into Zorin Appearance, we don't just have control of things like fonts, if not quite to the same extent that we do in KDE Plasma or Cinnamon, but what we do have here is the ability to select different desktop layouts. And so, if you want to easily experiment with your desktop and customization in Linux, you may want to check out Zorin OS. Moving on, the next thing that Linux does better than Windows is providing manual control of updates. Here in Windows, if we go to Update Settings, we can see that we do have control over optional updates, and if we scroll down to Advanced Options, we have a little bit of control over the automatic update process, including the ability to pause updates for up to 35 days. However, without editing the registry, installing third-party software, or using the Group Policy Editor in the Windows Pro or Enterprise editions, there is no way to take manual update control, and so to prevent time being wasted waiting for Windows to update at an inconvenient moment. This is, however, not the case in Linux. Here, for example, in Linux Mint, as in other distros, we have full user control of the update process. Indeed, by default, automatic updates are turned off, with the user simply being notified when updates are available so that they can decide when and if to install them. And so here we have an update icon on the panel telling us updates are available. Oh look, we've got 60 updates I've not updated for a while, and I can click if I want to install the updates, or if I wish I can review them first, looking down the list, and I can deselect updates I don't want to install. I won't do that straight away because uh, I'm making a video, and I want to show you that if I go down to the update icon and right-click and then select Preferences, this provides full control over updates and related notifications. This includes the ability to exclude certain packages from being updated. We can block certain packages if we wish, and there's also an automation button. So if you want, you can turn on automatic updates like you get by default in Windows, but you don't have to. You've got complete control here in Linux. And so on this system, I think I should apply my updates. There we go, they will now be installed. There we are, that's fine. And because this is a Linux system, we have to authenticate any changes to it. So I'll enter my password. There we go. And the update process will now get on with, well, updating. And as it does so, it's worth pointing out that because different Linux distros have different update managers, and because not all desktop environments are the same, the exact settings for updates won't always look like they do here in Linux Mint. But all Linux distros give the user more control over updates than in Windows. Greetings. Here we are logging in to Debian. There we go. And now let's also log in to Zorin OS. And for good measure, let's also log in here on my test rig running Linux Mint. There we are. And the thing that all of these logins have in common is that they all use a local account. And indeed, I'm not aware of any free Linux distro that requires the use of an online account. In the wonderful world of Linux, online accounts are required for certain paid-for distros, such as Red Hat Enterprise Linux and Ubuntu Pro, but in general, if you choose to run Linux, you will not in the process have to join a cloud ecosystem. In contrast, Windows does require the use of a Microsoft account. Granted, there are ways to get around this, as I've shown in other videos on this channel. But even if you do manage to run Windows with a local account, you will get occasional and deeply annoying messages like this one asking you to finish setting up a PC that is already perfectly happily set up. And so, once again, login via a local account is something that Linux does better than Windows. And, of course, you can set up the system to log in automatically if you wish. Right, we now get to something that may be controversial, but I'd argue that, for the average computer user, Linux offers a more secure computing environment than Windows. For a start, 
desktop Linux is used by a lot less people. And having just a few percent market share means that Linux benefits from security through obscurity. Or in other words, less malware is written for and targeted at Linux, so making it more secure. Although do be aware that Linux malware does exist. Secondly, security has always been a cornerstone of Linux from the outset. For example, by default, users do not have so-called root access to make fundamental system changes. As we saw earlier, in Linux, applying an update also requires password authentication, and this is also the case when installing an application. For example, here in the software center in Debian, if I want to install this program and I click on install, I have to enter my password. And all this means that in Linux, we can be more sure than in Windows, but only the software we want is installed on our computer. Now, regardless of the operating system used, we must of course always remain vigilant and take sensible security precautions. But I do personally always try to use Linux rather than Windows for online banking, online shopping, and administering my YouTube channels. When it launched Windows 11, Microsoft decided that tens of millions of perfectly decent computers would not be officially allowed to run it, and indeed that from October 2025 they ought to be scrapped. But fortunately, Linux has not abandoned older hardware. And indeed, if you have a more mature computer with sluggish Windows performance, installing Linux is often a great way to bring new life to older hardware. Some Linux distros still even support the 32-bit xx6 processors that stopped being manufactured nearly 20 years ago. And whilst this is not the case here in Ubuntu, if your PC or laptop is not that modern, and certainly if it has 4GB of RAM or less, it's likely to be far more comfortable running Linux rather than Windows 10 or Windows 11. Finally, the last thing that Linux does better than Windows is to offer a higher level of hardware independence and boot media tolerance. And this means that it's usually very easy to migrate a Linux install from one computer to another, as well as to boot from an external drive. To prove this, here I've got the SSD on which the copy of Linux Mint we've been using in this video is installed. I've removed this from my i5 test rig, and we're now going to plug it into this external SATA to USB adapter like that, and we're going to plug the other end into this Odyssey J4105 computer. So let's bring in our drive and plug it into a spare USB 3 port like that. And right now, the Odyssey has got Zorin OS installed on its system SSD, again, as we've been running in this video, but we should have no problems booting Linux Mint from this external SSD. So let's turn on the power and go across to the video output. And I'm gonna press the escape key to take us into the BIOS. There we are. We'll go across to the end there. And we're gonna boot from what I know here will be Linux Mint. It's a bit confusing because Zorin OS, the top here is based on Ubuntu, so is Linux Mint, but that's gotta be our external drive. So let's select that for our boot override. There we go. And if we cross our fingers, there we are, we are going to be booting into Linux Mint from a drive externally connected via USB and taken from another system. And it should all work with no problems at all. And indeed, here we are ready to log in. I'll just enter my password. There we go. And yes, everything seems to be okay. I would expect it to be okay, but it's great when things work, particularly when you're recording them on video. Now, it's important to note here that in recent years, it has become easier to move a Windows installation from one system to another. And indeed, modern versions of Windows will usually rerun their setup wizard to install drivers for the new hardware. But at the very least, moving a Windows system drive from one computer to another will require Windows to be reactivated. And this may require purchasing another license, something we don't have to worry about here in Linux. 
In addition, unlike most Linux installations, a standard Windows install will not boot from a USB drive. Microsoft used to offer software called Windows to Go to make this possible. But today, to create a Windows install that boots from an external drive, third-party software must be used. And so this is another area in which Linux is better. Now, I would note that a clean operating system install is always preferable when setting up a new computer. But in the real world, the fact that you can so easily boot a Linux system drive from one machine on another and over USB is sometimes very useful indeed. So, is Linux better than Windows? No, absolutely not. It's just different. And there are certainly things that Windows does better than Linux, not least Windows has got a far wider range of software support, and in my view, Windows has a better file manager. It's just more mature. This said, in a year in which many people are thinking of migrating from Windows to Linux, I thought it was important to point out the things that Linux, in my view anyway, does better, and I hope in that context you found this video to be useful. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe, and I hope to talk to you again very soon. Oh,